What I have for you today is an interesting case from Australia on PepsiCo. Now, there are some similarities with the Coca-Cola case that we've discussed before in the sense that both of these groups make syrups, which they then sell to bottlers, which then sell their beverages. So let's see what was going on here. So this was the Federal Court of Australia. Um, you can see it's a number of combined cases. The decision is from November 23. I must say up front, I strongly disagree with the decision, not because I think the taxpayer was good, but because I think there are some, fun, there are some fundamental issues with the decision. So let's see what was going on. So you have the PepsiCo group in the US and they have among the brands Pepsi and Mountain Dew. And PepsiCo acquired the Stokely Van Camp Group, or SVC, which holds the Gatorade Group. So, so the Pepsi and the Mountain Dew are fuzzy drinks and Gatorade are the energy drinks. And then they also have the Concentrate Manufacturing Company of Ireland, CMCI, and PepsiCo had a number of these Concentrate Manufacturing Companies around the world. And then you had Asahi Breweries, I believe they were in Japan, and they had Shrepsch AU um, Australia in, 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 in Australia, and that's referred to in the court as the Shrepsch Australia uh, Private Limited, SAPO. And these are totally unrelated parties from each other, right? SAPO was the bottler in this case. So the Stokely Van Kant Group and, uh, and, and CMCI entered into restated and amended exclusive bottling appointments, EBAs, in 2009, according to which Shreps Australia was going to make, you know, put the, put, put, put the fuzzy water in the syrup and then distribute the Gatorade and the Coke and, and uh, not the Coke, the Shrep, uh, the Pepsi and, 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 and all the other Pepsi brands in Australia. And the, and, and the court says under the EBAs, PepsiCo and SVC agreed to sell or cause a related entity to sell. So they could, they could appoint another one. Beverage concentrate or concentrate, sometimes referred to as syrup, to SAPL. The concentrate was to be mixed by SAPL with other ingredients in accordance with formula specifications and other information provided by the PepsiCo group to produce finished beverages for sale. And PepsiCo and SVC granted SAPL the right to use in Australia trademarks and other intellectual property to enable SAPL to manufacture, bottle, sell, and distribute the finished beverages in branded PepsiCo group packages. Now, of course, when you ask someone to sell your products, you want them to use your product names and your brands. If they don't, you will sue them to the end of the world. So these are pretty standard contracts. Make my stuff for me in that part of the world so I sell so I don't have to ship it all the way there and then sell it according to my instructions with my packaging, etc., etc. Now, we need to go a little further here <clears throat> because we have another two companies involved in the structure. And the first one is Concentrate Manufacturing, Singapore CMSPL, again, private limited. And just like the Irish company, it made the concentrate and it then sold or handed over the concentrate to PepsiCo Beverage or Singapore. Um, but PepsiCo Beverage Singapore or PBS was incorporated in Australia. So I do suspect there was some hybrid stuff and some treaty shopping and some tax playing Behind this, it seems highly unlikely that this just happened to have been a dormant company in the group, which they then decided to deploy in Singapore. But to be honest, I do not know. And then the concentrate went from uh, CMSPL to PBS, and PBS now sold the syrup to SAPL or Schweppes Australia. And it sold the syrup both for PepsiCo and for SVC as their nominated seller. Now, there are a couple of interesting things going on here, and I will show you. Let's just look at what the court says about the facts. These are the same pictures that we had before, and now the court describes the facts during the relevant year. CMSPL, so that's our Singapore parent company, produced concentrate according to the recipe or formula provided by and with flavor keys supplied by PepsiCo and SVC. So it both made category Gatorade and Pepsi products, like Mountain Dew, for instance, as well. CMSPL supplied the concentrate to PBS, a member of the PepsiCo group that was, despite its name, incorporated in Australia. Now, I, the court does not say whether it was also a tax resident of Australia, but I can Im imagine that Australia has a rule that says that if you are incorporated in Australia, you are by definition deemed to be an Australian tax resident unless another tax treaty under the uh, residence article places you, for instance, in Singapore. And then PBS was nominated as seller by PepsiCo under the PepsiCo EBA and as seller by SVC under the SVC EBA. PBS supplied concentrate to Schweppes Australia and invoiced Schweppes Australia for the concentrate that had been supplied. 
SAP Pell, uh, SAPL paid PBS for the contract in total. SAPL made payments of approximately Australian $240 million to PBS during the relevant years. And we'll come to what the relevant years are in, 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 in a moment. And then finally, PBS transferred almost all of the money received from SAPL to CMSPL, retaining only a small margin. So, so what I think happened here was PBS, because of its Australian incorporation, might have actually have been a tax resident of Australia. And that's why all the money had to go to CMSPL in Singapore, so that there's not a lot of taxable income left in Australia. But I am not sure. The court decision does not deal with this issue. And then the Commissioner of Income Tax in Australia attacked the structure in two ways. First, they said the primary contention is that each of PepsiCo and SVC is liable for royalty withholding tax pursuant to a Section 128B of the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1936. And, and here it comes, Article 12 of the AU U.S. Tax Convention from 1982 as amended. And that's what we'll talk about in this video. Where if, if Schweppes Australia made payments to PepsiCo Beverage Singapore, which may have been resident in, Aust in Australia, but in any case, the money ended up in Singapore, why are we talking about Article 12 of the U.S.-Australia Tax Treaty? That is the first. And then the second one is, and we'll talk about that in the next video, the alternative contention was of the, of the commissioner was that PepsiCo, if PepsiCo and SVC are not liable for royalty withholding tax, then the Australian diverted profits tax provisions of 1936 apply. Now, the profit tax provisions came into force in 2017, I believe, but it was built into the law from 1936. So let us look at what's going on with the royalties. A 10 second commercial. If you want to learn more about international taxation or transfer pricing, or treat yourself to an all round update, or if you want your team to learn or stay updated, please visit my online courses. Now let us deal with the question whether the payments made were royalties, right? So if we look at what the judge's conclusion is, and I'm starting at the back end here, he said that three questions had to be answered. The first was what, whether there was consideration for um, royalties, in, inter in other words, intellectual property. So that the payments made by SAPL were to an extent consideration for the use or right to use the items set out in Article 12, Paragraphs 4, A and B. Now let's see what that says. He quotes both Australian national law and the treaty. I'm going to stick with to the treaty, so I will ignore the national law because we're doing this for international tax purposes after all. <laughs> I have also concluded that PepsiCo and SVZ as parties to the EABAs were entitled to receive payments made by SAPL under the EABAS. PepsiCo and SVZ nominated PBS as the seller of the concentrate under the EABAS and thereby directed SAPL to pay PBS. In these circumstances, the relevant portions were dealt with on behalf of PepsiCo SVC or dealt with as PepsiCo SVC directs. And there's something very strange here, right? Because the payments are made from Australia to Australia or maybe from Australia to Singapore. So why? Are we looking at the US Australia Treaty? That is the issue being addressed. And the judge then said, accordingly, I consider the relevant portions of the payments are deemed to have been paid by uh, Schreps Australia to PepsiCo and SVC in the US, right? Now, the question is, were these payments royalties? And then he quotes the Australia US Treaty, which says the term royalties in this article means payments or credits of any kind to the extent to which they are consideration for the use of or right of use of any copyright pattern, design, model, plan, secret formula or process, and then it comes trademark or like property. And that is what we're talking about here because it was the brand name. And if we then go further, the judge then looks into consideration for, so has these payments been made for the use of the licenses of the brands in, in effect, and then says to afford the question whether payments are consideration for involves an exercise of characterization. Fundamental are the parts of the relevant agreement in their business and commercial context, right? So let's look at the bigger picture. Why do we have these agreements and then see if these are our royalties? This approach further furthers the evident purpose of Article 12, which is identifying the taxing rights of contracting states. It is plain from the wording of Article 12.4 that payments made from the consideration, regardless of how these payments are described by the parties to a transaction, right? Article 12.4 refers to payments or credits of any kind. Thus, payments made 
may be consideration for the use or right of use of trademarks, even if the payments are not called a royalty. And this is what, where the judge is going with it. So he says, it is all to blame from the wording of Article 12.4 that an apportionment exercise is envisaged. Article 12.4 uses the words, to the extent which thus a single payment may be, considered, may be consideration for more than one thing. In such a case, the payment is to be apportioned. In my view, it is apparent from the terms of the EBAs that the payments were, to some extent, consideration for the use of the relevant trademarks and other IP. Mr. Williams, so this was a, a, a company expert, gave evidence that in his role in franchising, he was not aware of the sale of PepsiCo concentrate ever being offered without a license of the brand. Now, obviously, it is not the case because you ask them to make the syrup and sell it as Pepsi, so you're going to have to give them the right to use the name Pepsi, but you're also going to insist on them using the name Pepsi because you will kill them if they don't. He said the concentrate and the brands always go together. Although Clause 4 of the SVC EBA describes the license as royalty-free, I do not consider this to assist in resolving the characterization. Article 12.4 makes clear that the way payments are described by the parties to a transaction is not determinative. Likewise, the way the license is described is not a determinative. So it, the judge takes third-party contracts and he throws out their definition of whether the part of the payment is for royalties or not. Thus, the approach adopted above does not involve any recasting of the transaction or the substitution of a different transaction as submitted by PepsiCo parties in response to the commissioner's submissions. It involves a consideration of the terms and features of the EBAs as entered into by the parties. And, and, and my fundamental problem with, with this case and this decision of the judge is this. I am sympathetic to the argument, maybe not very well put by the commissioner here, that when you make a combined payment for a product, part of that payment may be for intellectual property. And if it is made for intellectual property, then you are allowed to tax, um, levy a royalty withholding tax on that part of the intellectual property. What I have a, a bigger issue with um, is not even the setting aside of third party contract contractual terms, but why PepsiCo? There is intellectual property in everything. There is intellectual property in cars, in computers, in pharmaceuticals. You can hardly buy anything today which does not have intellectual property in it. And then the question is, should we, whenever we buy foreign products as a distributor, should we then always levy a withholding tax on that foreign product from the, from, from the principal if they insist that we sell their products under their brands? That seems to me quite an overcomplication of the world. And, and I'm going to leave the case here for this video and we will consider the rest of the royalty payments and the other issues involved in this in future videos. But I leave you with this thought. If PepsiCo should pay a royalty withholding tax here, why not every product that has embedded intellectual property?